thanks to everyone and appreciate your attending our club luncheon. Uh, the goal of the club is to bring together all Democrats from the most conservative to the most progressive to celebrate our shared values, appreciate who we are and to work together to put more Democrats in office. Um, <clears throat> and I'd also like to mention our club luncheon sponsor, Albrecht and Albrecht Law Firm has been supporting this luncheon for several years now. So if you need legal help, please think about Albrecht and Albrecht. Our program today <clears throat> will feature Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser speaking on defending our democracy. A um, little bit of procedural stuff here. Everyone's asked to stay muted except for the speaker, myself, and Kathy Devine and Karen Pontius, who will be handling questions. If you want to submit a question during the luncheon, please use the chat feature on Zoom and make sure that that uh, <clears throat> little uh, drop down there in the chat feature says everyone so that your question goes to everyone. But please do not unmute yourself and speak. If you're having any trouble with your internet connection, you may want to disable your video. Audio only works better on slow connections. This Zoom meeting is being recorded and will be available within a few days for viewing. You can also choose speaker mode, typically in the upper right corner of the Zoom window, which will bring up a larger video of the person speaking. And while the Laplata Dems are okay for funds right now, some of our biggest fundraisers have had to be canceled due to the pandemic. So I would encourage everyone to donate to the party. Uh, monthly donations are particularly appreciated and you can set those up on Act Blue. Uh, monthly donations make it easy for you to give to the party with relatively little pain. And before we get to Phil, I'd like to introduce Ann Markward, who's gonna talk briefly about a couple of upcoming events. So go ahead, Ann. Hi, everybody. We are going to have our first in-person fundraising, our one and only in-person fundraising for the season. It's going to be a hybrid of our normal Roosevelt's dinner, along with a picnic that we weren't able to do this year. We're calling it the Roosevelt's picnic. It is outside under a big tent. It's a buffet line with professional servers. Tim Sullivan's band will be there with a Western theme of dinner and dancing. It's gonna be great. We can meet all of the people who are stepping up to run for the Democratic nomination for CD3. So you guys have been asking about them. They'll all be in one place at one time. We'd love to see you there too. $75, great. And I believe the link for the donation for the ticketing is in the chat box. We do need all reservations by the 15th of August. So please do. Go ahead and click on that if you have any intention of being with us on Sunday, September 29, 5 to 8 p.m. at Blue Lakes Ranch Event Center. Beautiful location. We're really excited. The second thing, speaking of CD3, is the CD3 Redistricting Commission Roadshow is in Durango this weekend, and we could really use your turnout and support. The original staff plan was pretty Interesting, it turns us from being a plus seven, six or seven district, which gained us Lauren Boebert into a plus 11 Republican district, which ensures Lauren Boebert for the rest of our eternal lives. We think that there's an alternative plan that we can do that includes all of the watersheds, all of the national parks and public lands, and all of the ski areas of the Western Slope, plus the San Luis Valley, gets us to the right population level, gets us to a competitive level of plus three to four percent, uh, three to four points, which is great. We can do something with that. And links communities of interest like resort towns, watersheds, et cetera. If you're interested in more information, please contact me directly. We would love to have you speak or just show up and listen to what's going on Saturday, Durango Public Library, 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, also would encourage you to contact your friends and tell, make sure they know about the picnic on the 29th, um, <clears throat> since that's, again, our, our big fundraiser and we need to get as many people there as we can. Um, <clears throat> so this is our seventh club luncheon for 2021. Um, we were considering that we might be able to do these luncheons in person again, but given the increase in COVID cases, I think we're gonna have to wait till the first part of next year. So we'll just have to see what happens. And if anyone has any other announcements to make, please enter, enter something in the chat window and we'll recognize you at the end of the luncheon. Uh, and now to our speaker, Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser was sworn in as the state's 39th Attorney General on January 8th, 2019. As the state's chief legal officer, Attorney General Weiser is committed to protecting the people of Colorado and building an innovative and collaborative organization that will address a range of statewide challenges from addressing the opioid epidemic to reforming our criminal justice system to protecting our land, air, and water. 
Uh, Attorney General Weiser has dedicated his life to the law, to justice, and to public service. Before running for office, Weiser served as the Hatfield Professor of Law and Dean of the University of Colorado Law School, where he founded the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship, say that five times in a row, <clears throat> and chaired the Colorado Innovation Council. Weiser served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the U.S. Department of Justice and as Senior Advisor for Technology and Innovation in the Obama Administration's National Economic Council. He served on President Obama's transition team overseeing the Federal Trade Commission and previously served in President Bill Clinton's Department of Justice as Senior Counsel to the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division advising on telecommunications matters. Uh, before his appointment at the Justice Department, Weiser served as a law clerk to Ju Justices Byron R. White and Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the United States Supreme Court and to Judge David Ebel, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, <laughs> E-B-E-L, e at the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver, Colorado. He's the son and grandson of Holocaust survivors and Weiser is deeply committed to the American dream and ensuring opportunity for all Coloradans. Uh, Phil Weiser lives in Denver with his wife, Dr. Heidi Wald and their two children. So let's give a big virtual welcome to Phil Weiser. Phil, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. I was able to be with you in person on July 4th. And I wanted to reprise our conversation and have a more intimate one. It's about the state of our democratic republic, which is not well. Four forces are now being arrayed to undermine our democratic institution. First, attacks on voting rights. Second, undermining the idea of fair districts. I'll pick up the point that Ann made about Colorado's districts. Third, the realities of our campaign finance system, which is increasingly facing non-transparent and dark money, um, Citizens United being the core cause of those uh, ills. And finally, and maybe most insidiously, a wash in misinformation leading to extreme polarization. Let me talk about each of these. And then, like I said, I really want to have a dialogue. We've got such a great group here. The first point is voting rights. We are living at a time where we're seeing attacks on voting rights like none, let's say, since the enactment of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And I'll start with that Voting Rights Act and go from there. We have had amendments that Voting Rights Act to make sure it would be interpreted broadly to address efforts to undermine voting rights. We've now had two Supreme Court decisions that have undermined and gone against that clear congressional purpose. The first one being a case known as Holder versus Shelby County, where Justice Ginsburg in dissent complained about the majority's decision to gut a preclearance requirement saying it was like throwing out your umbrella in a rainstorm because you weren't getting wet. This spring in the Baranovich decision, case out of Arizona, we saw an effort to gut section two of the Voting Rights Act, which deals with discrimination after the fact. And the particular problem with this decision is it undermined the ability to address after the fact discrimination saying if the discriminatory impact was a mere inconvenience, we weren't going to get worked up about it. And thereby the decision allowed certain practices which had the clear and in this case demonstrated effect of making it harder of people of color, I think it was indigenous and Latinos to vote in Arizona. So Congress now has a imperative to do its constitutional duty. The 15th Amendment provides the right to vote to everybody, regardless of race. What the 15th Amendment also says is Congress shall have the power to enforce this article to protect voting rights. There is a John Lewis Voting Rights Act called H.R. 4 before Congress. The big question is, will it get out of Congress? And the reason this matters is increasing number of states are saying, if we can take steps that we know will make it harder for people of color to vote, that could be good for one political party. In this Arizona case I mentioned, at the Supreme Court, the Republican National Committee 
lawyer was asked, why are you trying to make it harder for Latinos to vote? And the answer was because they tend to vote Republican. We shouldn't be living at a time when there's an effort to cheat, to undermine fair play, to give one party an advantage. We should do what Colorado does, which is enable everyone to vote in a safe, secure, easy to use fashion. There's another law called the For the People Act, that's HR1, and there's variations being developed now, including in the Senate by Joe Manchin, the former Secretary of State, that would provide broad protection for a voting system along the lines of what we have in Colorado. Unfortunately for both HR1 and HR4, the question is now gonna be raised. What about the filibuster? The answer I believe should be simple. When it comes to protecting the democracy itself, a democracy itself, there's no room for a filibuster. We'll see as the Senate moves forward if they adopt that position. I sure hope so, because I'm afraid of a 2022 election where voting rights are undermined and where results are compromised. I talked about fair, trustworthy institutions. And one of the questions that we have is what will districts look like? Because one could imagine districts where the representatives draw them to suit their own needs. Or one could imagine districts done by independent redistricting commissions. We're doing that experiment here in Colorado. And it's going to be interesting to watch and it will depend on citizens being engaged. Because I can tell you from a competitiveness and a community of interest perspective, what belongs in the third congressional district, the San Luis Valley or Fremont or Taylor County? For those of us who know our state and for those of us who know the third congressional district, it's not a close call. On both of those grounds, the San Luis Valley has more in common with Western Colorado, where Fremont County and Teller County are more, let's call it affinity with Colorado Springs. And obviously you take a district and you make it competitive or you take a district and you make it less competitive. So we have a chance to use our voices for a citizen commission to do the right thing I believe that such commissions can be effective in taking political considerations out of district maps and make them fair. We're gonna see if that theory holds up this year. And if the map doesn't change, I like many of you will be disappointed that the principles, competitive districts, communities of interest being respected will have somehow been left aside when it comes to the third congressional district. Nationwide, we have to recognize the damage about gerrymandering because you have states like Wisconsin, where about half the population votes for Democrats, half for Republicans for Congress, but their delegation is eight to three Republican because Republicans in the state legislature have drawn those districts. That is a threat to democracy itself. Extreme partisan gerrymandering was almost found to be a constitutional violation by the US Supreme Court. It has been found to be a violation by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. It is a threat to democracy. We are modeling what fair districting can look like in Colorado, just like we're modeling protecting voting rights. Campaign finance starts with Citizens United, which when asked, Justice Ginsburg said, if I could overturn one decision with a click of my fingers, it would be Citizens United. That decision makes several errors. The first error is it says corporations are people and thus have the right to speak. And the second is it says money is speech and we're gonna protect political campaign spend wherever it comes from and allow it to unlimited amounts. And then the next question it had to confront is what do we believe that we will have transparency as to spending? And the court said, yes, we do believe that. Unfortunately, this past term, the Supreme Court in a case where the issue was posed, can states ask these corporations, in many cases shell corporations, for a list of their top donors? The answer was no. Those groups have a right to keep that information confidential, which begs the question, then what is transparent about that system, which Citizens United said would be the case? That to me bespeaks the challenges we have related to campaign spending. If large amounts of money spent by corporations are not known who they are, and if there's no ability to protect, let's say, 
a environment where people can uh, actually know who's speaking to them about that for democracy. And Citizens United has caused all those ripple effects. Ultimately, we need a change in Supreme Court case law, and I'll keep working for that. And then finally, misinformation, which of the four factors I mentioned, I probably worry the most about this one. And I worry a lot about the first three, so I'm not downplaying them. I'm just saying, if people can live in a universe where they get the information that reinforces what they already believe, if they are taught to demonize and hate others, disabling dialogue, that rips apart the basic fabric of our democracy. Our democracy is meant to be government of the people, by the people, for the people, and all the people. It's not meant to be a tribal battle where there are winners and losers. It's meant to be a discussion, a conversation about the collective. Our constitution envisions we the people to form a more perfect union, to secure the blessings of liberty. We are in this all together. And insofar as there's different perspectives, the best of our tradition, call it Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia, is that of engaged dialogue. And what we're seeing now, clearly aided and abetted by social media platforms, is people are being taught to demonize other people. People are being taught not to listen. And young people are growing up with that as their lived experience of citizenship, and that scares me which is why civic education is so important to give people a sense of what our constitutional tradition truly needs to be out. So as we approach this Constitution Day, I'm working on an initiative we're calling the Ginsburg Scalia Initiative to celebrate their relationship and to teach people what that looks like as a model for collaborative problem solving and looking for win-win solutions and listening as a way to refine your thinking. So we have work to do to defend our democracy on multiple fronts. Colorado, I believe, can be a leader in all of these fronts. And I am so honored to be serving as your attorney general. Gwen, should I start with Carol's question in, in the chat or how do you wanna proceed from here? Well, as, let, let me, as the moderator, use a prerogative. I mean, you've, you've clearly described the problems that we have. And I guess the question that I would ask is what, what can we do about it? What can we do about it at a state level? And I say we, not just, you know, not just the government, but people that care about these things. What can we do about it at a state level, at a congressional level? Is there, you know, something else that can be done? Um, <clears throat> so maybe you could just talk about that for, before we get into specific questions. Great. Well, first overarching, we have to make protecting democracy itself an issue that people vote about, an issue that people organize about. For a long time, gun violence was an issue that the NRA was able to, and at the national level, this is still true, exercise extraordinary influence, even though they took positions that most gun owners disagreed with. The American people overwhelmingly believe we should have background checks before people purchase firearms. But because the NRA has been far more effective at organizing, particularly at the national level, we don't have that law. Here in Colorado, an extreme risk protection order law, a red flag law. And the reason we have it is because people got engaged and organized and said, this law both respects responsible gun ownership and helps prevent people from being killed or taking their own life. And so we need people organizing around the principle of defending democracy. Are you a defender of democracy? And that means on all four fronts, you're committed to overturning Citizens United and restoring sanity to campaign finance. You're committed to protecting voting rights and revitalizing our Voting Rights Act. You're committed to fair districts and to getting rid of extreme partisan gerrymandering, and you're committed to civil dialogue. Gwen, on the last point, we all showing up in our day-to-day -day lives have an opportunity to be a part of that. And what I often tell people is, don't try to convince other people they're wrong. Don't demonize them for their views ask them questions and listen to their answers and build relationships. And we talked about this when I was with you just a month ago. If you're able to work with folks in Montezuma County, and I know you've got your commissioner Porter Norton here, 
that's going to be a way that we show what democracy looks like in practice. And we transcend that political polarization. So there's a lot of work to do. I am worried about the state of a democratic republic and I'm committed to that work and it has to be work we all do together. Okay, that's great. Uh, what we, we have two people that are basically watching the chat for questions. So I'm gonna go back and forth between Karen and Kathy and let them ask you questions and they can <clears throat> kind of sort out any duplicates and that sort of thing. So uh, Kathy, you wanna go ahead and start with the first one? <clears throat> yes. Um, why don't we go to Carol's question first, which um, Mr. Weiser was going to answer it anyway. And basically, how did the commission come up with the um, with the current map of CD3, CD3 that changed the competitiveness of the district? I don't know. This was done by a nonpartisan staff of the legislature. It was meant as a starting place. So obviously, think about this as a first draft. You revise your first draft. Why they started their first draft where they did, I do not know. Obviously, when you draw maps, there are trade-offs. For me, I've mentioned trade-offs that I see as um, compelling, putting the San Luis Valley in CD3. I'm not sure why they didn't. So do you, uh, just following on with that, do you think that um, these citizen meetings uh, will have an impact on the commission? Yes. Okay, thank you. Karen? Yeah. All right, um, way up in the chat. I know I've been putting a lot of stuff in the chat for you guys. So if you wanna just click on those links and save them on your computer, it's, it'll be great. Um, Nancy Van Dover asks, <clears throat> Phil, will you procure Colorado's portion of the irregulators money soon? LPEA is gonna decide this month whether it can afford to provide fiber to the premises and the primary obstacle is financing. With the approximately $4 billion owed to us, our state's rural electric associations and municipalities can cover our state with fiber. Please hold CenturyLink accountable so we can get safe, affordable, cyber secure FTTP, which I wish I knew what that meant. Fiber Forever. to the premises. All right. um, I know what that means, but I don't know what the regulator's money means. So, Nancy, if you want to follow up with me, um, share your information in the chat, I can make sure someone follows up with you so we can learn more about what these funds are and how we might work together. Okay. Uh, Kathy? Uh, let's see, from Carol again, is there any way around the broad First Amendment protection of our our constitution for deliberately false information about COVID in a national health emergency or for instigating an insurrection. You have put your finger on two of the possible exceptions. The First Amendment is broad. It generally protects speech with limited exceptions. Uh, one of them is an incitement to violence. So if you can prove someone incited others to violence, the First Amendment under a case called the um, Vandenberg decision is not necessarily a bar to liability. Um, that is a very high hurdle to meet, to show that someone kind of immediately and foreseeably incited violence. But if you can show it, the First Amendment is not a bar to liability. False health information is harder because I think you have to show that they knew what they were saying was false and they said it anyway, knowing it would have a harmful effect. So if someone says, I really believe that drinking bleach will treat COVID-19, then if someone drinks bleach, you could say, well, I thought that was true. Some, I heard that somewhere. And so it's not easy under the First Amendment to criminalize or even have civil liability for speech. Um, usually you have to know that what you're saying is false, or in the other case, know what you're saying is going to incite violence. 
Wow. Okay, Karen. I don't think we have any other questions. Carol, do you have anything more? <laughs> well, Carol's the winner here. She does. So, so let me throw out a, a crazy idea. I've run this by a few people. Um, what, what would happen if there were a law passed that said that uh, in a political campaign, you can't lie? <clears throat> and that gets, the reason it's crazy is because it gets back to some of the things you were talking about, Phil, where you'd have to show that the person, you know, actually knew that what they were saying was false. Um, but obviously, in you know, in criminal cases, intent is often determined by a jury. So, I mean, is there is there some way that we can, you know, we can take some of the lying out of politics? Not easily. Um, the the premise of our system is that voters will be able to ultimately suss out misinformation, and they will be able to punish people for lying. As we've seen, sometimes people can use lies to great effect. And now we're having a conversation about the big lie and whether, for example, Liz Cheney can survive as a Republican if she's unwilling to tell it. The problem, as you noted, is a defense is going to be someone will say, well, I heard it somewhere. Or I believe it. And the risk is if you overly regulate speech, you chill speech and you undermine a free marketplace of ideas. The problem that haunts me, and I think haunts our nation, is many people are not living this, let's call it open marketplace of ideas world. They're living in their bubble where they're only hearing what some people say and they're believing it. And that's the end of the story. Oh my goodness. I have uh, one more question <clears throat> that um, Carol put in just now. Why does SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, seem to be deferring to state legislatures in the face of the 15, 15th Amendment's power to enforce the right to vote? Did you mean 14th Amendment, Carol? Well, 15. 15 is, she's right. Yeah. Okay. She's right. 15th Amendment. It's, it is a... Um, it's a game of chicken that we're seeing right now. Oh yeah. And the courts are playing this game of chicken with Congress. And what is going to be determined is whether ultimately the courts will yield to Congress. I predict if there's a new Voting Rights Act, the court will yield in part for this reason, but they are certainly pushing Congress to have to speak quite clearly and specifically to get their way. Okay, and there's a question from Laura. How Marcia, are Marcia raised her hand, by the way, too, just so you guys know. Uh, uh, Laura writes, uh, how are secretaries of state in other states working to protect the integrity of elections, um, i.e. letting uh, legislatures decide the outcome? Okay, so a couple of points there. First off, we should celebrate the Georgia Secretary of State for doing his job. And we should be worried about him losing in a primary because he did his job. That's the most important thing we can ask is that officials do their job and play it straight. That happened in Georgia. And we'll see what the end result of that is. Here's the other thing happening. Because the Georgia Secretary of State played it straight, there were efforts by the Georgia legislature to cut back on the Secretary of State's power. And there have been some other efforts to aggregate power to the legislature. So the legislature has the ability through, call it political decision-making to override administrative integrity, or as I might put it, the rule of law. That will be quite a constitutional crisis because it's not clear to me that it is constitutional to say to the voters, I'm going to let you pick the president or pick who gets the electoral votes from our state. But if you pick the person I don't like as a legislator, we're going to override that result. It's crazy. It is crazy. And it strikes me as unconstitutional. 
because it's not it's in effect not counting votes that are um, set to be counted. But there are some states putting themselves in that position because the secretaries of state did their jobs and counted the votes fairly. That's what they should be doing. Um, I don't know if that will happen. They may blink and not use that power. If it does happen, the Supreme Court may say that it was an unconstitutional action. If ultimately an election is allowed to be swung where a state votes for one person for president, but then the state legislature overrides it, that will be a weighty constitutional crisis. And God help us if we get there. Thank you. One, one thing, Phil, we were, we were talking about, none of us are lawyers, so take this with a grain of salt. But we were discussing how it was that the Supreme Court over, what, what the rationale was for uh, overriding parts of the Voting Rights Act. Could you just kind of cover that in, I mean, you know, what, why did they decide that those parts of the Voting Rights Act were unconstitutional? So I, I'm going to share in the chat a really great article by Linda Greenhouse, who talked about Justice Alito's methodology. Justice Alito wrote that opinion, and the premise of his opinion was, well, look at the state of voting rights in 1982, and as long as we don't have fewer access to voting than 1982, we are going to say that we're complying with the 1982 Voting Rights Act Amendment. Uh -huh. The problem with that is it ignores the spirit and the purpose of those 82 amendments. The spirit and purpose of those 82 amendments was absolutely to make sure that voting rights were protected in a broad sense. Unfortunately, that's not how Alito approached it. And you can read, I think, the dissent from Kagan for the alternative view. I don't think Alito will ignore the will of Congress circa 2021. And so I do think you could um, see Congress putting the Supreme Court in their place and pushing for broader protection of voting rights. All right, I know marsha has got a question too. Yeah, first of all, uh, Phil, um, thank you for being here with us today and thank you for coming down here on the 4th of July. It's so appreciated to have this kind of access to our AG, so thank you. Um, I'd like to know what are one to two to three things that elect local elected officials can do to work on these concerns and issues. Uh, we have the, the um, ability to comment on the C3 map coming up. Um, there's a group here in La Plata County that wants to revitalize a very uh, awesome project called the Civil Dialogue that attempts to bring different views together. The pandemic kind of stopped that for a while, but what should we be doing? Well, I think on all four fronts, you are doing things that matter. So. I had a chance when I was out there to visit with your county clerk and to talk about the commitment to enabling every vote to be counted. That's the way democracy should work, getting ballots out to everybody, allowing them to cast their ballots in a safe, secure, and reliable fashion. You're doing a great job in your county. With respect to campaign finance, I think it's to be aware of the potential influence of dark money which can even come into local elections and to be quick to call it out. Um, I certainly faced this in my campaign. Last time I had $6 million by this national group, the Republican Attorneys General Association that they sought to sway people's opinion with a series of attack ads. And again, calling that out is a way you can also um, act. Obviously it will take a lot during Citizens United. That's not necessarily something any of us individuals can do, but we're gonna to need to change the competition of the Supreme Court and to have attorneys general and others like myself pushing the court in the right direction. On districting, I would not underestimate how important it is that we get this experiment right in Colorado. If we end up with 
districts that look like they're gerrymandered through this process, that will reinforce cynicism. And it will also look like there's no such thing as fair districting. It'll be just that the Democrats got snookered by a process where they thought they were on the high road, but lo and behold, they were a sucker. Um, I do not want that to happen. First and foremost, for principled reasons to protect democracy, I also don't want Democrats to be the sucker in the story. And CD3 is the test case because both the competitiveness and the communities of interest line up clearly what should happen with the San Luis Valley. And then Marsha, I love your point about the civil dialogue project. I think the work on opioids that Durango and Cortez can come together to do will show that we're all citizens. We're all mm -hmm. Coloradans and we work together to solve problems and that will cut through some of the demonization and will build fellowship. We had our first meeting last week, by the way, and your staff person was on, on board and um, yeah, brought our region together, the conservative and the maybe less conservative and progressive commissioners and organizations to start to get to work on expanding treatment. So thank you to your office for being there. Looking forward to working together and hopefully coming back for a joint meeting at some point. Uh, Carol's got another question. What is Colorado's Supreme Court's role in approving the final map? I believe, and I'm going to have to give you the caution that I've not looked at this closely enough, so I'm not 100% sure. But I believe the oversight is to ensure compliance with the law. And so after the commission has its say, either it automatically goes to the Supreme Court or someone will appeal it there for that review. Thank you. <clears throat> Karen? One more question. Uh, Ann asks, uh, if not sure if this is your bailiwick, but there's much concern in the San Luis Valley about their aquifer getting drained or, and or pumped out to Colorado Springs. One of the reasons they want to ally with CD3. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that as a reason to be in CD3 but I will say water matters in the Valley the way it matters in Western Colorado. Um, it matters greatly. And it is important that we all do our part to make sure we manage water in the right way. And I'm worried about what could happen to the San Luis Valley. And so I've been engaged on that issue. Uh, it is, it's worth being nervous about. Uh, here's another one from Shirley. Uh, Republicans wrote amendments Y and Z. The commission did not buy the software and do not draw the maps. The Supreme Court is not allowed to review the fairness of the maps. Is that your understanding? Uh, I am not sure I follow the question. Um, the, the Supreme Court, I believe, has authority to ultimately review the maps to ensure they comply with the law. Um, I think maybe the question is the review is not a generalized fairness, but it's to ensure that what was done was legal. And it's quite possible that there is a expectation that insofar as there's reasonable different ways to do things, the commission gets discretion which way to do it. But if it's clearly unreasonable how they did things, there, I, th I believe there could be a legal challenge. But again, I have not studied this closely enough, so I don't know all the ins and outs of how it works. But what I'm giving you is that's the general norm for administrative law. When any agency acts, um, the general norm is there is judicial review. So I'd be surprised if there was no judicial review here. That would be um, very different. Okay, thank you. I believe also that the commissions have uh, asked the state Supreme Court to allow them to not meet the deadlines that are in the amendments, given the fact that they are not getting census data on time. Do you, do you know where that stands? Have you been involved in that at all? Um, so the census was delayed uh, actually for reasons that our office had some part in, because we were pushing to make sure they weren't playing games 
asking about where people um, might have come from and what their immigration status was. And we thought that was risking undermining a fair census count. So by the time the census was managed, the timing was off. Um, Carol asked a follow-up of, uh, so the court will be looking at the six factors set forth in the new constitutional provision? Is that one? I'm not sure I'm following that. So there's there's basically within the amendment there's six things like competitive districts and yes. communities and so on and it's it's your understanding that that's what the Supreme Court will look at and it, I mean it sounds like that's what you're saying that they will look to make sure that whatever was done met the criteria that are in the amendments. Not only that, they will have to also make sure that it's consistent with one person one vote under Reynolds v. Sims, a Supreme Court decision, and consistent with the Voting Rights Act. Okay. And I do see Hi. another question. Yeah, He's from Dick White. Yeah. Um, Dick says, asks, looking beyond 2021, is the enshrinement of equal numbers of Republicans, uh, oops, lost my, <laughs> um, R's, U's, and D's as equal, is, let me say this again. Is the enshrinement of equal numbers of R's, U's, and D's as equal partners in future redistrict, redistricting a risk for the future? In other words, what if there is a new party that gains strong support? So this is a interesting question. The challenge for any new party is our system really strongly encourages a two-party system. The way new parties would have more opportunities, if there was a system, you probably heard about this because New York just did it for its mayor election, of ranked choice voting. That would give people more room to express preferences for third parties and not throw away their vote. Under our current system, it's gonna be hard to have traction for a new party. Thank you. Karen? Okay, we have one more question. Um, Nancy Van Dover writes, uh, A.G. Weiser, I am severely EMS disabled, which is electromagnetically sensitive, have been a prisoner in my shielded house for more than a year and a half since a cell tower turned its beam onto my property. My ADA slash FHAA rights are being violated. How can you help me and other EMS disabled people in the state, which now comprise 6% of the population? We need help. Many are pushed from their homes and are refugees. I'm sorry about that, Nancy. Um, I'll have to look into that issue. I, I had not heard that one before. What is FHAA, Federal Housing, um, Nancy? It's uh, the Fair Housing Act Amendment. Okay, thanks. And uh, uh, A.G. Weiser, one of the things that is causing uh, systemic discrimination against the EMS disabled in um, pretty much every city and county in our state and across the country is that um, the Federal Access Board um, guidelines for the EMS disabled um, are not being put into the building code. Uh, they were in recommendation status and they were not codified. Uh, I don't know what our uh, Colorado state uh, equivalent is for this, but I would really like for our state to have um, um, these, these something similar so that the EMS disabled have guidelines that can be put into uh, the, the building code so that we have public access. I, uh, what's happening is that uh, the, the wireless 
communications have been put in um, without putting without any um, with having without having the EMS disabled in mind to be able to accommodate us to be able to turn off the Wi-Fi systems so that they're not connected up with security systems and record keeping systems. And uh, so the, the Federal Access Board guidelines, uh, the IEQ report was first made in 2002 and in 2005. And um, so they could have been, uh, the, the new buildings and those that were remodeled could have been uh, keeping the EMS disabled in mind while putting them in, but they weren't. And as a result, I have no, and neither do any of the other EMS disabled, we have no safe hospital, no ER, no, I haven't been able to go to an eye doctor, to a dentist. If I break a leg, I cannot go to the hospital. I have the only medical care I have is one chiropractor who will turn off his Wi-Fi at the end of the day, and I have telemedicine. That is so it. I, so let me let me ask Phil. I mean, so I, I, he's, I just, he's coming I'm up with a a particular case here. Is this something that the attorney general's office can assist her with? Is it something she needs to talk to legislators about? Uh, what would be the? I, you know, I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on this, Nancy. Um, right, I understand. We're running out of time, but you know, Phil, maybe you can give her a little bit of uh, guidance on how to approach this. Well, and I see that Phil has said that he he fights for civil rights, and I was so happy. I, I voted for you, and uh, I I I really need my civil rights uh, defended here. Um, so our office does not enforce the Americans. The Disability Act. Uh, I do believe it's enforced through private lawyers who can, I believe, get attorney's fees. The other point Nancy mentioned was about housing codes, which I believe are developed on the local level. And I don't know all the different trade-offs. Part of the challenge, just from the first description Nancy gave is it may be that certain entities are relying on these wireless communications, which they have a hard time not relying on to accommodate Nancy's uh, condition. And so that's a, that's a challenging situation. The key language from the uh, ADA is that if you're a healthcare provider and you're trying to serve someone with a, a disability, you'd have to make a reasonable accommodation. And so Nancy, your argument would be they're failing to do that. Uh, I don't know what lawyers in Durango would take on such cases, but the ADA is enforced in federal court with private counsel usually. Okay, thank you. Um, just got, going back to that original question about the irregulators, there's apparently a large amount of money uh, and I don't know if you remember, you probably don't, but back in 2018, you and I talked for just a moment at a fundraiser about, you mentioned that the uh, rural electric co-op should get involved in broadband. <clears throat> and I, I said, yeah, that sounded like a good thing. And we're, we're kind of pushing hard for that here. Um, so if you could take a look at that irregulators case uh, <clears throat> and see, again, I think, you know, we wanna make sure that we're getting our share of the money that's coming out of that case. Gwen, if you can um, give me your email again in the chat, I'll loop you in as well as Nancy and Tim Sheckley on that opportunity. Okay. What else no do we have? goes unpunished. <laughs> Looks like Dick put another question in there. You want to pick that one up, Kathy? Well, it's not a question. It's it's. It looks like it's an answer. To, to, to my observation that local housing codes are relevant and, and it answers Nancy's question. Apparently, usually local governments don't do much uh, except around the edges because they want to follow the International uh, Code Council. Okay. Let's see. Um, Carol has another question. Who will control the dollars that will come to Colorado? for broadband if the infrastructure bill passes? 
I don't know yet. It's possible it will be the governor's broadband office and we'll wanna work with them to make sure this money gets spent as wisely and effectively as possible to get the most bang for our buck and to make sure we're taking advantage of the opportunities we're talking about, including with co-ops playing a role. Great, thank you. I don't see anything else. Okay. Well, we've had a wide ranging discussion. Um, I really appreciate all of you uh, joining me and look forward to the continuing dialogue. Gwen, any final thoughts or questions you have? Uh, no, I mean, I could probably go on for a couple hours, but <clears throat> we don't have that much time. Um, so, you know, obviously Phil is running for reelection and we'd like to see people donating to his campaign. I don't think you have an opponent yet, do you? I do not, but I, I can't wait till I do because by the time I know I do, like Mark Udall in 2014, maybe too late so yeah um and i i will when i send out the link to the recording i'll also send the uh, chat <clears throat> so if you didn't get a chance to get a you know the information that you wanted out of the chat that should be available uh <clears throat> with the email um <clears throat> so i i really appreciate phil taking time out of his very busy schedule to meet with us and let's give him a big virtual round of applause <clears throat> um, i think he's doing absolutely Absolutely wonderful work for the state, and we are definitely supporting you for re-election, Phil. I appreciate your support. It means a lot. And uh, like I said, I will uh, be coming back. And everyone's involvement makes a difference in whatever way you can. I know it's easy to get discouraged, even cynical. Um, please don't. Please stay engaged and look forward to uh, working with you in the years ahead. Uh, nicely of Karen to put my campaign website, take a look, share information, feel free to donate, volunteer. Um, thank you all. Great space and time with you. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we hope we, we don't have our speaker lined up for next month yet, but as soon as we do, we'll get some information out. And we're looking at, I think, a couple of pretty interesting people. So uh, stay tuned and we'll hope to see you next month. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan.